hear, hear the word of the Lord. Ecclesiastes 8 and 8 says this, No man has power to retain his spirit. What you, in the New Living Translation puts it this way, No person is able to extend their life beyond God's borders. The truth of the matter is, we have no power over the day of our death. I'm sure that your life is as busy as my life is, probably maybe even more so. I began Monday early at 4.30, came here at 4.30, met Jimmy at 5.30, drove all the way to South Carolina. We had a great service there, came back and, and sat with a brother who, who lost his sister or in the Lord, his wife. And all week long, it's just been one thing right after another, from morning to dark, and then after that with it, I'm sure that's been with all of you, the joy of seeing so many kids come to the Lord, the, the heartbreak of, of seeing kids' parents I have a clue about what they're doing and trying to minister to them in the parking lot. And even now my heart just yearns today that parents would come. And yesterday with the funeral, and I, I, we drove almost, almost to Nashville late Friday night to take our grandson back. And, and that's just a small thing compared to all the things that you do. But here's what I know today. Here's what I know today, that life slows down for no one. Life slows down for no one, and as we come to the end of our study today, we're going to see Paul, the apostle. Remember, his journey is through. He's fought a good fight. He's finished the race. He's kept the faith. He's at the end of his journey, and he said to Timothy, as we're going to preach about today, come before winter. Now, I, I love what John Wesley said, that, that great preacher. He said this, God buries his workmen, but his work goes on. And so the truth is, as we do life together, that we have, listen to this, we have many decisions to make, but we have one deadline. Say the word decision with me. Decision. Now say the word deadline. Deadline. So are you at a decision or are you at a deadline? I hope that you are at a decision, but if God's brought you to a deadline, I want you to hear this. What we're about to read together, Paul's not discouraged. He's not skeptical. He's not sarcastic. He's not been scathed by the world. He's at peace because of what God has done in his life, and he's walked and made the right decisions by the grace of God and the power of God. So, so I, I want to read to you. Look, look in your Bible in chapter number 4 and verse 19. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Here's what it says. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila and those living in the house of Onesiris. Arasta stayed at Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick at Miletus. And then verse 21. Now, sometimes we, we're contextual as a church family. We preach exegetically, and so you're going to be kind of surprised today because I'm going to pull out just one part, but I promise you we'll exegete all through what we're doing today. But I want you to see what he says. Look at your Bible. Do your best to get here before winter. Now, in, in the ESV, it says basically the same thing. Do your best to come before winter. Some translations do say come before winter. Now, now there's both a literal and a figurative meaning here. The literal meaning is this. In the, in the day and time, it was getting in the, almost the winter months. Remember in Acts chapter 27 that Paul got in a storm because the, the ship, ship people, they would not listen to him, and they went in the wintertime, and they had a boat wreck. And, and literally he's saying, Timothy, if you don't come now... My deadline's coming, and not only that, if you wait a month, you may want to come a month later, but there's going to be the winter time, and you won't be able to make it, so you'll have to wait till next spring. Anybody ever put off any decision? Now, that's the literal meaning of the text, but, but figuratively speaking, if you go back to verse 9 of, of chapter 4, you'll see this with me. He says here in that text, do your best to come to me soon. The King James Version uses the word diligent, which actually has this meaning, be intentional. If you're not intentional with your decisions, winter will come up on you before you know it. If, if you're not, not only intentional, if you're not also realize that your decisions are governed by God, that you will find yourself coming at the end and you might say this, that you was not happy about the journey. Remember when it got personal for Paul and Timothy, look on the screen, it got personal for them, and Paul said this to Timothy, remember, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news, and here it is, fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Now, think about this with me for a moment. All of us have common decisions. We made the common decision whether to breathe or not this morning. I, I assume and I suspect that I don't, I don't think it's a big push for me to say we're all doing that together in a common way. Amen? At least a few amen. Some of you are awake now. 
We also made the common decision to use our breaks coming to church. How many of you are glad for that? Amen? I'm just glad we did. And we, and we made, hopefully in this room, everyone's made the common decision to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But we know there's a world that has not. But we have, beyond the common decisions, we have the unique decisions. Every one of you this morning got up and, and you chose from your closet the, the clothes that either you bought or, or some guys in the room, maybe that your, your wife said, you ought to wear this. Uh, you don't have to look down in this moment to say that. Uh, you, you got them there and you made, a, you made a unique decision. And you made a unique decision. I look at Danny often in the first service when he gets, uh, you never know what service he's going to be in because they're always serving. Uh, whether you had a chocolate Pop-Tart, a blueberry Pop-Tart this morning, or, or whether you had an energy bar, there was the unique choices that you you have, and you have the unique choice of whether you'll answer the phone call or not. But then there's some unique choices that are really, really important in our lives. And so Paul here in his life, writing to Timothy, was speaking to him about the unique choice in his life to follow God. And so today, today in this sanctuary, I just anticipated, there's going to be moms and dads who come today with kiddos with them today. The, the next service will be completely full, and they've made a decision to have kids, to raise them either in a biological way, an adoptive way, or a blended family. And boy, they got some decisions to make. There are students that will fill the, fill the second service and some in this service now and watching online, and they've got choices to make. No, they've got some decisions to make. I mean, it's coming quickly upon them. They'll graduate before long, and they'll have to decide what to do with their life. And then there's the young adults in our group. They're, they're starting to make decisions. They're out there, and, and they're being pushed by you, by the way. What are you going to do with your life? They're being pushed with their decisions. And, and then there's the other adults in the room. Let's be honest today. Come on, let's be honest and amen in a moment. Life is whipping us around. It's just absolutely whipping us around. I mean, it is so busy. You're just so active. And, and listen to this. And you come to the senior adult years, and it hardly ever ends up the way that you want. Charles Carter, the preacher who was at First Jonesboro, preached over 50 years on the same sermon, Come Before Winter, and he said this, I've never met a person who said to me at the end of their life, I wish I'd spent more hours at work. So now you, you say, I believe that, and it was like, ow! But do you really practice that? Someone recently said to me, and I've heard it all my life, that I can remember of my life, that, that life is cruel. By the time you figure it out, it's, you're too old, now you got to die. Life's not cruel. Life is busy. But God has given us the answer. He's given us His Word. He's given us His Spirit. He's given us His church. He's given us people that if we'll hang out with them and do the right thing. And, and, and even with Pastor Rick, he wouldn't look at me this morning in the first service. You know what I was, y'all didn't see it. I was doing this like, slow down. Can I say this to you today, some of you? Slow down. Some of the things that we are giving ourselves to are decisions that are pushed upon us by the enemy, and we think we have to do them, but in reality, God has a better plan for us. And so what I want to do today, I want to walk with you through the text and just kind of remind you a little bit that Paul wasn't in prison himself, but in this unique moment from God... As I, as, I, as I tied this together last year, I, I've been preaching through 2 Timothy now in some places or another for a year. Started last summer uh, in our student camp and then overseas. I, I did it with pastors uh, in, in the dirt of Africa and went to Romania and did it with them and came back and finished writing the book and put that together. And so we launched in January. So, so I've had almost a year sitting at the end of a man's life thinking about what's important along with many other things. I want to tell you there are three things that God has taught me. Number one is this. There will always be tribulation on the road of your life. From beginning to end, there will be tribulation. Look back at chapter 3 of 2 Timothy and verse 12. It says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. In your life, there are things that are going to happen. Look back with me in chapter 1 and verse number 12. Here's what Paul said. He said, I'm suffering right now, but I'm not ashamed for I know in whom I've believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard that which I've committed has been entrusted to me. In my mind, as I think about his tribulation and where he was, I immediately moved to your tribulation. Do you know why that you are in tribulation? The Bible says in Psalm 16 that if we will keep our minds stayed upon the Lord, that in verse 11, that we'll see He's at our right hand and we don't have to fear. 
I just think that for most of us, as we come here together, that, that they are some things that are tribulating in us, and we don't know why. You say, what do you mean? Well, there's some obvious reasons as it comes on the screen. We're in a broken world. I mean, we all know that in the, in the first service. We are in a broken world, so there's going to be broken things. Am I correct? You see, you're going to have tribulation from the moment that you're born. And, it, and listen, God has looked down from heaven and said, you have it, you don't have it. Listen, there, it's obvious that we're in a broken world. And it's obvious, too, that, that we are broken people. In Ecclesiastes 7 and 20, the Bible says there's not a righteous person on the face of the earth who's born. So you're going to have this, this tribulation. And remember chapter 4, if you go back there with me, chapter 4, remember verse 17 when he said, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that I might preach the gospel. And then in verse 18, he said, The Lord rescued me from every evil deed. There in verse 17, again, the lion's mouth. We are in a spiritual battle. And the obvious thing is this, Ephesians 6 and 10, it's in the heavenly. Tim Delina said it this way, your battles and blessings are in the same place. So if you're in tribulation today, there's some obvious reasons, but also this, there are not some obvious reasons, so not so obvious reasons. There's some things that work that, that you don't know. God positions himself in the heavens, and he says this to you in your life. I'm going to let you walk through this, and I'm going to walk with you so that you'll know more of who I am. But many of us don't realize that. Many of us come to what, what Michael Dixon said in his commentary. We come to the winter time of our soul. You say, Keith, what is the winter time of your soul? Listen to this. It's a time of bleakness and coldness and darkness. It's a time when you're fruitless. It's a time when you lack the energy to engage in the activities that used to fill you with joy. I've been at this thing 32 years, and can I tell you, by the grace of God, I long to come to church every Sunday morning. A little something wrong with my truck. I don't know what it is. And so, so this morning, like, sure, now you know you've got to take me early to church this morning. She's like, oh, I forgot that. I've been at this a long time. I want to tell you, I'm, I'm in a season, Brother Michael. I'm in a season. You've walked with me when it's been hard. I'm in a season right now where it's joyous, and I'm not in the wintertime of my soul, but maybe you are. Can I tell you this, that God's with you in that too? That God is with you when the season, when, as Miriam Dixon said this, you're, you're, you're brooding. You're up late at night. You're not sleeping well. Most things that you are doing right now feel dead or they appear to be so. Can I tell you, God is in them and you can't see it. God is in your moments. He, as the songwriter said, is in the details of your life. But listen to me, when you are tribulating, you have a choice. You have a decision to make. And for me, it's a Romans 8, 28. It says, all things work together for good. Those who love him are called according to his purpose. That God is in everything we face. I wish I'd known that at 12. I wish I'd known that at 16 when I went through the first loss of a person that I loved dearly and they died and I was asked to be a pallbearer. I was, I was overwhelmed. I wish I knew that at 25 when I got married because of our, my first tribulations in a brand new church wor worky, working 16 hours a day in the service station that I owned and, and then trying to study at night and, and finish my degree. All those things going. I wish I'd known that then. I would have enjoyed my daughter Beth a little bit more. I wish I would have known in a growing, exploding church and, a, and our second church has exploded. I wish I would have known that when those trials come, that if I would have just slowed down and I would have just not tried to get away from them, but just experienced them as God would have wanted to, I would have been a better pastor. You see, when you're tribulating, sometimes you just, you just find yourself in such a difficult moment, but I don't see this in the text. Because if you look back with me in chapter 4, and when he says here in, in verse number 20, when he says, do your best to come to me before winter, he goes on, I discovered this in verse 21, and said, Eubulus sends greetings to you. Who was this guy? He's in prison with him. See, he wasn't the only one in prison. And I want to tell you that, that, that everybody around you are tribulating. It may not be obvious to you. They may look like that they've got the world by the tail, but they don't. I mean, they may have their hair in place every time you see them. They may always lie to you and say, everything's good. But I guarantee you there's no one under the sound of my voice today that doesn't have some tribulation. But the question is, what will you do it? What will you do with it? Which leads me to number two. I've learned this in my life. There will always be choices on the road. You see, you can discipline yourself. Here in this prison, Paul reminds us here that he wasn't alone. There was Putin's and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. And I did the research and I discovered this, that one of these couples were actually married. Now watch this. A husband and a wife both had made the choice to follow Jesus, even if it meant they went to prison. 
You see, I am thankful in my journey that I have learned that if I will walk with the people of God and make the right choices together, when I am in my time of weakness, they are strong. Some of you today, that is the key. You're not in a connect group or, or you're in it, but you're not in it. You know how you come to a moment, you're, you're not really there, even though you say that you're there because you're just moving right along. Some of you in your marriage are there, but you're not there. Some of you have things that you want to say to each other. Remember the decisions that we made, the choices we made early on in our series. Go back with me to chapter 2 and verse 20. Here's what chapter 2 and verse 20. Look back with me. I'm just tying up the knot. Now in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood, clay, and some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Do you remember that passage? Do you remember when we made the choice to cleanse ourselves from what's dishonorable so we'd become a vessel of honor? Remember we said we'd want to be vessels that God could use? Remember down in verse 25 when we made the decision that we would, uh, excuse me, verse 24, that we would be the Lord's servant. You see, you made a choice, some of you, a long time ago to follow God, but, but listen, some of you have forgotten it. So here in this moment, as you're making choices, we call them decisions headed to a deadline. Let me give you some application. One is this, put God first in every decision. We don't do that, let's be honest. I mean, let's be honest, we say we do, but, but tomorrow morning when you stopped to get the biscuit, did you ask him? He said, if I did that, I'd never get anywhere in life. That's why you are where you are. I have learned in my journey to listen to this, to be re refuse the trap of me first. Anybody else? The trap, like what do you want? One of the biggest arguments that we have in our home is where are we going to eat when we're traveling somewhere? Now, there was a time that I thought it was false humility and that, uh, that, that it was a fight, but the reality is that in our home, I have a precious wife who really just wants to eat where her husband wants to eat because she wants him to be first. And in my home, I truly, genuinely want her to be first, and so I'm genuinely honest as God is my witness in our home. It's what we want together in our lives. So I want to ask you this morning, are you involved in some things right now that you've put God first? If so, I want you to know that your choices are good choices. But if you are not putting God first, the, the, you say, well, how will I know if I'm not putting God first? You will tribulate and it will hurt. If you're putting yourself first today, you're at odds with everyone around you. If you're putting yourself first, you will not be successful. It happened with me uh, this week uh, uh, with, our, with our children. And, and, and Monday, I think actually Tuesday, I was upstairs. As ben and the team were doing such a great job, Stephanie and all of them. And I felt like the Lord said, don't present the gospel on Thursday. Let them do it. But then, then Wednesday morning, I, I still kind of felt that way. But, but I realized something, that, that I was just tired. And they were doing a great job. And, but the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, I've given you the assignment to tie the knot. So I went to you all Thursday morning, and I said, hey, I, I want you to know I need to do this at the end. And so I, I sat there in fear and trepidation on the platform and sat down with them and brought all the kids in close. And the Lord said, I got this because you've now put me first. I don't know what you're going through now, but it may be an issue. For Paul, it was Paul that God was first in his life. But secondly, you've got to accept God's personal assignment. I believe this with all my heart. Paul was here in this prison, and, I, and I've had a year. I want to tell you, I've had a year with this. I've had a year of ups and downs and joys and happiness, and I would just say that God's given us a measure of revival of all that he's doing in our lives as a church family. We are debt-free. God's doing great things. We're love and unity. People are joining almost every week. I mean, everything is up in what God's doing. But I realize something. God's assignment is sometimes difficult. You see, look at Paul with me. Look at me one more time. Look in your mind's eye. Look with me in the cell he was in. Look with me where he was. And I wrote this. This cell now became his private prayer room. The songwriter who wrote the song, In the Garden. I come to the garden alone. Literally that they were in a Chinese prison and their job every day was to clean the latrines and they would all sometimes make this man eat, the, eat, eat, eat what he was getting rid of. And so he decided this, that he would turn that filth into his prayer room and he called it his garden. So I come to, in, into the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear draws me ever so clear. Think about this fact that when you look at what you are, it's God's assignment for you. There he was alone with God. God locked him up so he could hear him speak. A brother in our church recently had a knee replacement, and I called him. 
And he was sitting there, I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm in some pain. And I said, that after we talked for a few moments, I shared love and compassion with him. But then the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart. And I said, brother, don't waste this time. You have a Bible in your house, don't you? He said, yes, sir, I do. And I said, I want, you, I want to ask you to lean into God now. To lean into him now. And yesterday, I mean, he's just a great guy. He was here yesterday. You know what he said to me yesterday? I, I don't think he's ever said it to me before. He said, I walked by, if we talked for him, he said, I love you. A grown man to another man. See, God has got an assignment for you. And you've got to turn it around and look at differently at it. Listen to me. The words we are reading from First and Second Timothy, and then next Sunday I'll talk about in Titus, came to us from a man who accepted his assignment in a prison. So what was your assignment? What was it that God just so set you on fire for, but now you've let go? Or what is it right now in your journey, in your life, that you know that you're supposed to be doing? Let me give you the third practical thing is this. Refuse to put off God's assignments. Just, just don't put them off. You see, the Bible says today's the day of salvation. If you don't know the Lord, today's the day. There's no other day but today. I, I think about those. I wrote this in the book. I think about those who have unfinished business in their families. I've stood too many stinking times beside of a casket with somebody knowing the truth is that they didn't apologize before their loved one died. I have too many times sat with people in counseling sessions where that I knew behind their meanness and their hate and their hurt, it was, and you get in behind it, there is this hard issue that they had that somewhere along the line they stopped and didn't do what they were supposed to do. You see, God continues His work, but for them, that fellowship stopped, Mike, right there. I see it happen so many, so many times with that. Pastor Charles Carter, if you can pull it, just pull, pull up Pastor Charles, Char, Car, Charles Carter and come before winter and you'll hear his message. He shared the story of a, of a young guy in his church, a teenager that was killed in an automobile accident through alcohol. And three weeks after that he died, his mom and dad got saved. And he said that it went on for a period of time, and one day the mom and dad came and wanted to see him, and they came in and sat down and said, you know what, we realized something. That our son was killed in a car wreck with alcohol involved, not because of his own doing, but because of ours. Because we socially drank every weekend in front of him. And as far as we know, we got saved too late for the sake of our son. I sat and wept before God many times in this past year with people, Brother Jimmy, who have had opportunity after opportunity to do something in their family. If you just take a courageous stand in your assignment, I know it hurts on the front end, but if you refuse God's assignment, there will be a moment in time when we'll stand before God. He won't ask us about our jobs as far as did we work enough. I, I don't believe that'll be the case. I think he'll ask us about everybody that we've met. And that's why whenever you read the Bible so many times, there are these hard names that you can't even pronounce who they are. See, because God just said, I'm going to include them here. The Paul says, Timothy, come before winter. J. J. Vernon McGee spoke about this very clearly in his writings and how that, that, that Paul knew what he was saying. Jerry Vines, the, the great pastor from First Baptist uh, in Jacksonville, preaches a message about this. And he said, imagine, imagine if Timothy just decided to wait until the spring. I can just hear him now with that, that golden throat voice saying, imagine Timothy in the spring coming with the parchments of the Old Testament, coming with the jacket. Imagine him coming with all that he'd ask him to bring the books. And he comes and he's looking all through Rome trying to find these underground prisons. And he finally finds the one where somebody else says, I think Paul's there. He knocks on the door of the prison. The jailer comes and he says, can I help you? And he said, I I'm here to see Paul. You see, Timothy loved him with all of his heart. I have lived with this for a year. Knowing that this young man was following his mentor. This is how serious this is. If you've never had someone that you wanted to just be like them. If you've never followed someone in the faith. 
When Adrian Rogers died, I wept for two weeks. Because I understand when you follow someone who's walked with God. Imagine Timothy hearing those words if it would have been. And the heartbreak because he waited too long to come. And the jailer says, I'm sorry to tell you. He died last winter. History tells us that they believe that that Timothy did go and he did make it. And history tells us that for 30 years he held the office that Paul held. And he also would die as a martyr. You see, here's the last little thing that I would tell you. Not only will there be tribulation in your life and there will be choices along the road. But I would tell you this, there will be a meeting with God at the end of the road of life. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's once appointed unto man to die, and after death comes the judgment. Has anybody in this room had a near-death experience lately? Have you had lately the loss of others or some trials that, that you absolutely are just being whipped around? If that's you right now, that's God's knock at your heart. That's God's knock at your heart. When we were battling the call to come here, God specifically did some things in our lives to prepare us to come, and we didn't know what they were. God removed staff, God positioned everything, and then God put us in perpetual revival. We were baptizing every week when Danny Smith snuck to our church. But he was clearly speaking to us, and then when my oldest son said, I'm not going with you. Those were moments that we had to make decisions in our lives. Because we knew there was a deadline, and I'll forever thank God that He led us to the right choice. These have been the happiest years of my journey. These have been the happiest years of my journey. And as after next Sunday morning, actually this week will be on sabbatical, and I'll be writing for the fall and for next year. And, and then next week for the two weeks here, and I will not be, be here in the pulpit at all. There'll be two great preachers. I mean, some of the greatest preachers in America will be here for you. Then I'll slip back in on the 21st and speak that day, and then head to Romania with the team. Because I just believe the next years for us are the best to come. I just believe that what's coming for us, but I believe today that, it, that we need to understand something. Here it is. Don't wait for God to clear up your life at the end. Don't wait till the end. Don't wait for God to have to do something so dramatic that you will awaken, but will have wasted so much of it that you can no longer do it. You see, I have so much Bible inside of me now that I know this, that the busier that I am, I can still recall the Word of God. I know that Sherry and I, by the grace of God, have lived a clean life together so that I'm not worrying at the end that the outside substances are going to destroy me at the end. By the grace of God, we have been able to to make some godly choices, but I want to ask you this. Listen to me. Are there things in your life you need to get rid of now? 2 Timothy 4, uh, Corinthians 7 and 10 says it this way. For godly grief, grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation. Here it is. Without what? Worldly grief produces death. Some of you are slowly dying and you don't even know it. Listen to me. I I would tell you this. Don't waste your life on the good when you could have experienced the great. Have faith to step out. Have faith to step in. Have faith to lay down your past. Because the best is now. Because God has chosen, listen to me, all over our country, people are coming to the Lord. Lastly and finally, don't miss heaven. If you're here without the Lord Jesus Christ today, I want to tell you, run to the cross. Don't miss heaven. Don't be fooled by those who tell you that baptism will do it. Don't be fooled because you've been a member of this church for a long time or watching online. Don't don't be fooled by that. Because a true faith is a living faith and is a growing faith in the midst of trials and tribulations. It is a faith that needs not to be regretted or that you have to make up that you have one. For I know that I know that I know that I've come to know Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions. And check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.